Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Proverbs 20, verse 6. And very quickly, also Matthew 7, 3 to 5. I'll start from Proverbs. Proverbs 26. Somebody is thinking, Chibi, they said PL should come and preach on love. Which one is this again now? Missing it. Proverbs. Proverbs 26. So I read. Most men will proclaim each his own goodness. But who can find a faithful man? Matthew 7, 3 to 5. Matthew 7, sorry, I'm taking some time. Okay, so I read. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? How, how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrites, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you because the entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the simple. As we come hungering and testing after righteousness, let us be filled this morning in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for myself that you anoint my lips of clay and help me to deliver your word exactly the way you sent it in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Everybody wants a good thing. And there's nothing wrong in that. Okay. <laughs> For those of us that want a topic, the topic of this message is the, lo the love quotient. The love quotient. The love quotient. What's measure of love? The love quotient. Okay. So like I was saying, everybody wants a good thing. And everybody who is interested in marriage wants a good marriage. And that's valid. There is nothing wrong in that. I've never seen anybody going into the institution of marriage saying, I hope it doesn't work. And if indeed there's somebody like that, <laughs> that's some deep psychological and spiritual issues. <laughs> but you see, in wanting a good thing, it's easy to waste somebody else and find them wanting. It's easy to place someone on the balance and say, oh, they are not good enough. But... Step on the scale. Have you weighed yourself also? Step on the scale. It's easy to pick faults, to criticize, to find everything that is wrong in somebody. But we rarely look inward to see ourselves the way we actually are. Now, please note that this is completely different from when somebody that has been there and done that or that has gone ahead of you is pointing out some things to the end that they may correct you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you just pick somebody and then you decide, okay, maybe they are suggesting the person to you as a spouse, but you can see every blessed thing that is wrong with the person. Step on the scale. Some people can find fault. They are so critical. They will find fault in someone's character, the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they think, the way they eat, the way they dress, the way they look. That one is the scariest. Can you create them? How can you find fault in the way somebody looks? You see, it's, 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 you have the right to remain silent. Honestly. Christians, more than any other set of people, need to understand that we have the right to choose silence. You don't need to tear anybody down. You don't have to join every conversation. A simple no will do. If somebody comes to meet you, you don't like him, don't tear him to pieces. No is sufficient, honestly. A simple no will do. You don't, you don't get to just use words to... <laughs> anyway, that's not where we are going today. That's not where we are going. My aim today is to help us to turn the searchlight inward. Inward. You know the way we look at everybody and you say, ah, this one, this one, this one. Let's look inward. 
Let's look inward. And you see, first, start by asking yourself this question. You, and if you were a guy, can you ask this you out? Hmm? Can you marry you if you were a guy? Would that be a good choice? Or will it be marrying a prayer point and baggage? These are the questions I believe we should ask ourselves. You see, when we choose to shine the spotlight on ourselves, the searchlights, when we choose to look inward rather than looking at other people, some things happen to us. Something happens to us inside. We should all be conversant with the psalmist prayer. Know that prayer in Psalm 139, 23 to 24. Psalm 139, 23 to 24. It said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You should learn to look inward and weigh yourself. When we look inward, we find, we become humble. You find humility. You find graciousness. Because when you weigh yourself and see what you are seeing, you suddenly see that you can extend grace to other people. You see, looking inward, putting the searchlight on yourself is what Jesus was trying to help them do when he said in John 8, 9, that he who has no sin should cast the first stone. Jesus was not condoning adultery. He was just saying, weigh yourself in the balance too, in comparison with this woman. Don't just be so quick to judge the woman and to castigate her. Weigh yourself in the balance. No one is more humble, kind, gracious, or patient than someone that understands his own weaknesses. Than someone that acknowledges his own weaknesses. You see, when you get into the understanding that you've received grace, it will be very easy to be gracious to other people. It will be very easy to be gracious to other people. That's why I like scriptures that, that humble us. Scriptures like Psalm 100 verse 3. Know you the Lord, he is God. It is him who has made us and not we ourselves. See, when I read it, I'm very humble. I do not make myself. Scriptures like that, they are, they are good for the soul. Or else scripture is profitable though, but I know you understand what I mean. <laughs> Sometimes, when I just look at myself, hmm, and I think about all the different contradictions in my nature, I used to appreciate my husband especially. I said, this, this man, <laughs> he has the patience of a saint, honestly. <laughs> you should look at yourself sometimes and just be grateful for the people that love you. You are not the most lovable person on earth. Be very thankful for the people that love you the way you are. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to list a few things that I would like us to examine as individuals. Hmm? When I've been saying step on the scale, step on the scale, these are the things I want you to look at. It's okay to want to marry someone great, but maybe you should start by being someone great. So, the very first thing as a person, weighing yourself, settle the question of identity. Who are you? You see, if you don't know who you are, you are just going to want to cause confusion somewhere or with somebody. Who are you? Settle that question first. Be able to answer that question correctly. Who am I? Settle the question of identity. Now, I know that if I were to ask that question this morning, if I say, who are you? Who are you? I'll hear varied answers. Somebody will say, I'm a lawyer. And that person will say, I'm a man. Somebody will say, I'm a mother. Someone will say, I'm Mrs. Somebody. But you see, all those things, all those things, they are what you are. As a Christian, those things are what you are. They are not who you are. As a Christian, I will tell you who you are in one sentence. You are a child of God. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is the correct answer to the question, who are you as a Christian? All those other things, I'm a banker, I'm a mother, I'm a this. They are what you are and they are beautiful. But who you are, that is the part of you that can never change. Here on earth and in eternity, you will always be a child of God. That is who you are. And you see, it's important to settle the question of identity because <laughs> I've been in places and spaces that if you don't know who you are, you'll be very intimidated. Very intimidated. There are a lot of people out there. See, there are, always, so there are people that are richer. 
better looking, better dressed. So if your identity is in all these material things or what we can see, they will intimidate you, some intentionally. Have you ever had someone size you up and you know they're sizing you up? <laughs> if you don't know who you are, You'll be, You'll be totally, totally intimidated. intimidated. Who, are, who you? are you? Can you answer, can you answer, that, answer question that question correctly? correctly? Some people have been Christians for years, but they don't, they don't know the correct, correct answer to that question. question. You still you ask, still ask them, them who are you. They'll, they'll tell you what they are. They are. Who, are who are you? I am a, I am child, a child of God. Of God. That's, That's who you are. are. I am a child of God as a Christian. You are who God tells you you are. You are the salt of the earth. You are an eternal excellency and a joy of many generations. Isaiah 60:50. You are the apple of God's eyes, Zechariah 2, 8. You are the beloved of God. You are the light of the world, Matthew 5, 14. You are first and foremost and always will be a child of God. Settle that question of identity. Your identity is in Christ. Your identity is in Christ. I cannot emphasize it enough. Your identity is in Christ. It is not in what you wear or what you drive or what you have. As a child of God, your identity is in God. Who are you? You are a child of God. You see, the spirit himself had to bear witness because it would be unfair of God and very unlike his character to leave this all-important question unanswered. The spirit himself bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. That is the question of identity. Settle it. Who are you? I'm a child of God. First and foremost, beyond everything else, I am a child of God. As far as you are a born-again Christian, who are you? You are a child of God, and that is your identity. Nobody can take that away from you. You are a child of God. Settle the question of identity. Settle the question of identity. If you don't even settle this question until you really understand who you are, you may not be able to make the right choice of a partner, except by mercy. You are a child of God. That is the correct answer to who are you. Everything else fades, but you are a child of God. Okay. So what's the second thing I want us to look at? You should focus on becoming, not appearing. Becoming, not appearing. You see, nowadays, a lot of people want to, social media and everywhere, people want to appear happy. They want to appear rich. They want to appear spiritual. They are not so interested in actually being those things. They just want to appear, you know, pepper them gang, so that other people can see it and know you've made it in life. <laughs> Galatians 6, 7. God is not mocked. God is not mocked. Don't be that person. Don't, don't be that person that is all about appearances. It is really unfair for you to marry someone and then the person will have a case of what I ordered versus what I got. No, no. Be who you are. Appearances will not get you anyway, honestly. If you know that you don't like where you are right now, the right thing to do is to work at it, to move to where you want to be. Not to try to fake it or try to appear to be what you are not. Look in that mirror, step on the scale. Are you being yourself? Are you living a real life? Or if someone marries you today, will they start saying, this is not what I ordered? Focus on becoming. Stop trying to appear. Focus on actually becoming over appearing. Hallelujah. The third thing I want us to do is to look at yourself capacity-wise. You need to build capacity. Build capacity. As our 37, 31 tells us that we are to take roots downward and bear fruit upward. We have to take root downward and bear fruit upwards. You have to build capacity in every aspect of life. If you are pursuing a career path, what is the professional exam that will make you shine in that path? Do that exam. If you are pursuing a trade, what will make you stand out? Whatever you do, just build capacity. Whatever path you've chosen in life, build capacity. Don't be wanting something you can't maintain. There are some people, you see some ladies now, they are so radiant, they are shining, they are on fire for God. If they marry you, will she still be like that? When I say don't, don't want something you don't maintain, I don't even mean it financially. So that's valid too, but 
I'm talking about strength in the inner man. Can you maintain that person? As a lady also, if he marries you, will he still be a high flyer? Or are you going to drag him down into mediocrity? Don't be wanting something you can't maintain. Build capacity. <laughs> I go one day, I was watching a movie with my husband, and we watched the first scene. We watched the second scene. He said, I, I feel like the way we are even watching it, our IQ is dropping. I said, <laughs> I agree. I will just change this. But you, that is what you want to watch with your eye flying boyfriend. And you, you are now angry that it's not romantic, he's not joining you. No, no, no. You have to build capacity. Financially, spiritually, learn to pray, learn to worship. Don't be that person that people always have to prompt. That's not how life works. People will not always be prompting you. Have you prayed? Have you worshipped? <laughs> well, as one would say, the most important ingredient in daily devotion is the devotion. That's what makes you stand up. Everybody is tired. There's nobody that is not tired. What makes you actually stand up when the alarm rings is the devotion you have for God. It's not the alarm that wakes you up. It's not that they live less stressful lives. The most important ingredient is the devotion. Build capacity. Don't wait for someone to come and carry you through life. That's grossly unfair on anybody. Spiritual capacity. Financial capacity. Emotional capacity. Career-wise. Vocational capacity. Build capacity. It's easy to look at somebody and say, ah, I don't want that person. It's not this. You <laughs> How is your own? Also, he's not successful. He doesn't have a good job. Do you have a good job? Step on the scale. Weigh yourself first before you start pointing fingers. Hallelujah. Okay. What number is that? Number three. Okay. So, number four build character. Build character. The Holy Spirit said this to me one morning, and it has stayed with me. He said, gifts are received, but fruits are cultivated. Anybody can receive a gift. If I hand my phone to you now, I dash you, you've received it. But do you know what it takes to cultivate, to, to have fruits, to manifest the fruit of the Spirit? You cultivate it. You work at it. See, it takes humility to admit to yourself that, oh, I'm not as patient as I should be. I'm not as kind as I should be. And to actually yield to the Holy Spirit to fix you. So you see, in choosing, in searching, don't pursue gifts. Look for fruit. Ladies, by their fruit, you shall know them. He may have gifts, but look for fruit. And you see, if you have both the fruits and the gifts, happy are you. Fantastic. But if you have to choose between the two, always, always choose fruit. Over gift. He may be able to preach. He may be able to teach. He, she may be able to sing. But is she patient? Is she kind? Can she love the first Corinthians 13 way? Build character. Build character. Are you kind? Sorry, I started pointing it outside again. I'm pointing you inward. Are you kind? Can you love the first Corinthians 13 way? So you can look at someone and pick faults in their character. But you see, love suffers long. Love is kind. Love bears all things, endures all things. Love does not boast itself. Build character. When I say character, what I mean in summary is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit have to be very present in you. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Love, joy, peace, kindness, Temperance, self-control. You can't have all those and you say you don't have good character. That is character. That is what it means to build character. The fruit of the Spirit. Build character. Yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. Everybody is looking for a kind lady. Are you a kind man? You are looking for a patient man. Are you a patient lady? Weigh yourself in the balance. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, number five, right? Build relationships. Build relationships. Proverbs 17, 17. 
A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for the day of adversity. Build relationships. You see, don't always enter into relationships because, okay, I want to marry this person. No. And don't, don't always tag relationships by what you think you can receive from the person. No. You should enter a relationship, friendship, or anything, just genuinely wanting to be a friend. Don't be calculative. Don't be trying to define if I'm friends with this person. Maybe one day you'll be able to. No, no. That's not how scripture asks us to love. You have to love at all times and be there in the day of adversity. Build relationships. Just learn to show yourself friendly. You see, when the scripture says it is not good for man to be alone, it's not just in the context of marriage. Human beings were, were, were formed to thrive in community. Build relationships. Build relationships. Work at building relationships. You see, if you now, you don't like everybody. She too. She doesn't do people. <laughs> so, both of you now get married. Mm-hmm. <laughs> both of you now get married. What happens on the day of trouble? Hmm? Hmm? Scripture says, Ecclesiastes 4, 10b. Woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Woe to him who is alone when he falls. So you that you don't like people and she that she doesn't do people, two have become one and you fall. What will happen? What will happen? Okay, somebody wants to point me to Psalm 21 to 2. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. But let's finish that verse now. He says, may he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. But all the people in Zion that the Spirit can touch, you don't greet them. You don't like them. <laughs> it is important to build relationships. Build relationships. And you see, that's, that spirit of witchcraft that used to make people want to chase everybody your partner knows away. It is the spirit of witchcraft, honestly. So you start dating someone, she has had some friends, some friendships have spanned 10 years, 5 years, even longer than that. But suddenly because you are dating them, you want them to cut all those people off, to shut them off. How now? Why? No, 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 that's, that's manipulation. In fact, when you want to isolate someone like that, we are very concerned because you may have a plan for, for the person after you've isolated them. Let's face it. It's not everybody your spouse is close to that you will ever be close to. is not. But as far as there's nothing unrighteous going on, just leave it now. Just let them maintain their friendships. You can't you can, you can say, my friends must be your friends. If it works out that way, fantastic. But if not, so I agree, you have some friends in common, but they are allowed to have that. It, it is witchcraft to want to chase everybody away. Change your sim. Change everything. You are now with me. You cannot relate with anybody again. Oh, no, no. Build relationships. Build relationships. As far as they are not evil companions, they are not influencing the person to evil. And they are not, there's nothing unrighteous going on. I'm not talking about all those bestie in quotes and all those rubbish. Just leave it. God help us. <laughs> okay. In looking at yourself, what next are we, are we talking about? You have to love yourself. You have to love yourself. Mark 12, 31. Request that we love our neighbors as yourself. If you've not learned to love yourself, you cannot really love others. And don't expect to find happiness in somebody else. Don't outsource your happiness. You see all those lies of... When I get married, I will be happy. What happened to now? Can't you be happy now? Don't outsource your happiness or your joy. It, it, it's unfair. It's a burden that should not be placed on anyone. You give somebody so responsibility for your happiness. Is he a clown or a comedian? No, no. No. No, no. Don't outsource your happiness. Love yourself. Don't be that kind of person that is always making their their love tied to future things. Maybe when I, when I get a better job, I'll be happy. When I'm this rich, I'll be happy. 
when I lose some weight, I'll be happy. I'm not saying there's no room for self-development. Even as you are working on doing those things, be happy now on the journey to where you are going. Love yourself. Love yourself. Be kind to yourself. Be patient with yourself. Love yourself. <laughs> I remember a friend of mine, my very good friend, she called me one day many years ago and she went, let me do I just, I just got this revelation. I said, oh, okay, what is it? She said, no, this, this revelation, you know what I'm talking about. This revelation, it was so freeing. It really set me free. I can't believe that all these years I've been living without this consciousness. I said, I'm so happy. Okay, what is the revelation? I said, no, wait. You see, the revelation really lifted a weight off my mind. And this, this, this. I said, okay, so what's the revelation? She said, I'm human. <laughs> I you see, if you, it's easy to laugh, but if you know my friend, you will understand that that revelation was very freeing for her. You know those people that employers talk about when they are saying, we want a can-do attitude, a go-getter? Those kind of people. <laughs> my friend believes she can do all things, organize all things, and manage all things. If you are not careful, she will manage you. <laughs> I, I'll give you a story. At my sister's wedding, I invited her, of course. And then, <laughs> we were in the church, but the caterers that brought the cake, they were outside. They had gotten outside, and we didn't even know. So someone called me, and then me and my then fiancé went outside too. And we saw my friend. She does not know the caterer from Adam. She has never met them before. And she was holding ground with them that, no, you will not put that cake there. I am telling you, it will be there. <laughs> <laughs> and if you see this person that is talking, very brief person, like Selim, <laughs> you will not. And I'm like, ah, but why? She said, no, can't you see the angle of the sun? The sun is going to come out in a few minutes and it will eat this cake directly. I am telling you, they cannot place it there. They said, no, madam, we are not even placing it there permanently. This is the space. We just want to put it here. She said, you have two choices. Either put it back in your car or take it to the permanent place. You are not putting it here. Ah, honestly speaking. She can hold ground with anybody. <laughs> she, she can manage anything. So when she, she told me that she realized she's human, I understand what she was saying. She was trying to say that. God has finally showed her that you have limitations. <laughs> you cannot manage everybody. You cannot be everywhere. And you see, I pray for each of us that God will give us that one or the multiple revelations that will make you fall in love with yourself afresh. Because for me, my own revelation was, I'm a child of God. I've heard that phrase several times. Do you know since when we've been hearing, you are a child of God? But one day, the word child just jumped out at me in that phrase. I'm a child of God. And I realized, I'm a child of God. I don't always have to have it together at every time. I, in the sight of God, I'm just a child. <laughs> Please, let me rest. It was very freeing for me. You see, some people just, some of us just need to hear, I have a father. That's the revelation you need. Some people that, that, that will make you love, respect, and appreciate yourself afresh. Some people have been battered and abused all their life. They just need to hear, I am somebody. I'm a person. Some need to hear, I am lovable. Some just need to, it needs to get in your, into your spirit. I am free. I am bought with a price. So the end time you think you're not valuable and you remember that God bought you. He didn't just get you for free. You just smile and you love yourself a little more. Because I am bought with a price. I pray you get that revelation. That it may not make sense to other people, but to you, you will just know that this is God freeing me. This is God making me fall in love with myself afresh. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. I think I'm the champion of short sermons. <laughs> Number seven, love the Lord. Love the Lord. When you ask anybody, what kind of person do you want to marry? The first, more often than not, except now that people have consciously started trying to sound different, the first thing you hear is, it must be God-fearing. Huh? Are you God-fearing? <laughs> I mean, the things you do, God, the Holy Spirit sometimes is very concerned and very afraid. Are you God-fearing? Do you love the Lord? I know of no better thing that anybody can do for themselves than to love God. Honestly. 
Take it from someone who knows. In October, it will be 20 years since I've been loving God. Love the Lord. Love the Lord. You see, love the Lord so much that with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, such that all your actions are prompted by the love for God. When I give, yes, I know that scripture says that give and you will receive, so yes, there's that part. But I, I always tell God that God, I'm giving because I love you. Because with this money, your kingdom will come. Your will will be done on it. I'm giving because I love you. When somebody talks to you anyhow, as my Ibadan people will say, she is your. you don't have to answer. It's not because you don't, when you, when you refrain from speaking, it's not because you don't know the right answers or you are not sharp, but because you love the Lord. And he has said your words must be with grace, seasoned with salt. He has said that as much as lies within your power, you should live peaceably with all men. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So you see, when two people, hmm, these things are not things you do just because you want a spouse. The fortunate thing, you see, Christianity is, is quite straightforward because I've found that the features and the character sets that you need as a good Christian, they are almost exactly, if not exactly, what you need to be a good spouse. You don't need a new syllabus to now start studying to be... If you've been a good Christian, if you are living as a good Christian, you will be a good spouse. That's it. God's commandments are not grievous. He doesn't expect us to learn this set of rules for this and go and learn another set for that. Now imagine if two people who know who they are, who know their identity is in Christ. Hmm? Two people more interested in becoming than appearing, real people that are working on a daily basis to build capacity and character. Two people who know how to show themselves friendly and who understand that you cannot make somebody else responsible for your happiness. Hmm? Two people who love the Lord with all their hearts. Imagine those two people coming together to build a home. Don't you know that will be something beautiful? So you see that giz, giz, giz feeling that we are calling love? Hmm? The portion of it, the quotient of that that you will need will be very little when all these things are in place. Do you understand what I'm saying? Look inward. Look at yourself. Step on the scale. Step on the scale. Ask yourself these valid questions. Do I know who I am? Am I more interested in appearances or in actually being... Am I building capacity in every aspect? Am I building my character? Do I have the fruit of the Spirit? Am I building relationships? Am I showing myself friendly? Do I love myself? Have I discovered I'm human? <laughs> Do I love God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my might? When you can answer all these questions in the affirmative, then you are ready. You are ready. You are it. Being preparing for marriage is not buying microwave and keeping it that <laughs> so that it won't be expensive when after the wedding, you know, now they may not give you as wedding gifts. <laughs> this is how you prepare for marriage. This is how you prepare for marriage. Let's bow our heads as we talk to God. Just talk to Him. Just talk to Him. The Lord. Help me to look inward. Search me, O oh Lord. Any of these points that have been mentioned that I need to work on. Give me the grace to be the doer and not just the hearer of the word deceiving my own self, Lord. Help me, help me, help me. Help me. Not to just continue in mediocrity. Help me to build character. Help me to build capacity. Help me to be a perfect find. Not just to be seeking a perfect find. Help me to be a perfect find. Help me to love you, Lord, with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. Help me to love myself, to appreciate and respect myself. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Thank you.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you've sent your word and I've delivered it to your people just as we sent it, Lord. Thank you for grace to communicate. Thank you for your power backing up the word. The grace to be doers and not hearers alone. I pray you give to all of your people in the name of Jesus. Help us to be all that was in your mind when you created us. Help us to build capacity, character, to love you, to love ourselves, Lord. Help us to understand who we are in you. Help us, Lord. For in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise.